What is the gospel? They say it's good news. But why? It seems as though it is simply a list of do's and don'ts, and we keep beating ourselves up for not being able to obey them all. No, the gospel can't be law. The gospel has to do with death, but the death of sin, so that we can truly live. The gospel isn't a one-time thing. It is a journey, a journey through every area of life, a journey through our ups and downs, a journey through trials and triumphs, a journey to the Father's kingdom, a journey that needs to be rediscovered. So let me ask you today, have you ever rediscovered something or maybe rediscovered someone who previously was important to you. Something that you forgot about, or maybe someone with whom you were disconnected for many years, and now all of a sudden you have reconnected with that person, or you have reconnected with that thing. For example, Maybe it was a friend who uh, previously was extremely close to you, but for some reason for years you disconnected only to rediscover and rekindle your friendship. By the way, isn't Facebook good for that? And so, I mean, all of us have seen people that we haven't seen for years and we connect on Facebook and, and we rediscover that friendship. Maybe it was a hobby that you used to practice and, and you thoroughly enjoyed, but The busyness of your life caused you to lay it aside, and recently you picked up that hobby again. Maybe it was a food that you ate as a child, and you just really loved it, and for some reason for years you didn't eat it, and all of a sudden you started eating that food again, and you've renewed your love for that food. Whatever it was, you have recently rediscovered it. And as a result, your life is richer, your life is fuller, your life is better. That's the way I feel about the gospel. Now, now don't get me wrong today, I never forgot about the gospel. I never neglected the gospel. I certainly never abandoned the gospel. But, But I believe that for years I misunderstood it and maybe even minimalized it just minimized it just a little bit in my life. Let me tell you my testimony. I was raised in a great church. I was raised in a Christian home. At the age of five, I realized that I was a sinner, and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. At the age of six, I was baptized. You say, man, that's young. I know I was just, I I was raised in a Christian home, and I heard the gospel ever since I was two or three years old. My my problem, though, wasn't that I didn't receive the gospel and accept the gospel. My problem, though, is that I viewed the gospel as a one-time deal in my life. The gospel saved me from my sins. The gospel guaranteed my future in heaven. But it had no practical power in my everyday life. God saved me, but overcoming sin and personal growth was up to me. It's almost, I thought, as if God said, okay, Brian, I did my part, now the rest is up to you. And and for years, I struggled trying to please God, always being discouraged, always being dissatisfied, thinking as if God was up in heaven on any given day looking down at me and going, could have done better, Brian. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I know you preached today, but you know, you kind of got mad at that guy on the way home from church and you could have done better. And, And I never understood how the gospel applies not to my moment of salvation, but how the gospel applies to my life right now. How the gospel makes me a better husband. How the gospel makes me a better father. How the gospel helps me to understand my relationship with Jesus Christ 
right now. Such a truth has revolutionized my spiritual walk. I have rediscovered in my life the magnificence and the life-giving power of the gospel. I'm convinced, though, that I'm not the only one who has misunderstood the gospel. I'm convinced that there are many people today who have confused the gospel with a host of all kinds of things. They've confused the gospel with religion, and the gospel's not religion. They've confused the gospel with rules. I sat down with a gentleman the other day that I had in my office, and I asked him, I said, so, so tell me in just a few words, what is the gospel? What does the word gospel mean to you? And he sat back and thought, well, I guess... I guess it's a bunch of rules that I'm supposed to live by. And many people view the gospel that way. Many people view the gospel as if God wants you to be prosperous. And if you really become a follower of Jesus Christ, then then eventually you're going to be wealthy. You'll hear that often in social media and on television. There are many who misunderstand the gospel. Believers today who are living a discouraged and defeated life. It's not that they're not trying. It's not that you're not trying. Many people are trying their best to, to do what they're supposed to do. But they fail to realize that everything they need for this life and everything you and I need for the next life is available through the gospel. Of Jesus Christ. So today we begin a journey, a journey to reacquaint ourselves with the gospel. And my goal in this series, we're going to be looking at it for the next eight or nine weeks, my goal, my desire is for us to see the gospel not just as a means by which you and I get to heaven. We don't view the gospel just as a get-out-of-hell card or a ticket to get into heaven. But we view the gospel as the driving force behind every single moment of our lives. And so today we begin in Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bibles open, Romans chapter 8, one of the great chapters of the New Testament. Romans chapter 8. Follow along, beginning in verse 1. I'm reading out the ESV. You can follow on the screen or follow on your phone or, or um, a Bible if you have one. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By the way, if you underline your Bibles, that's a great verse to underline. As a matter of fact, would you read that with me today? Let's all read that together and let the truth of that sink into our lives. Would you read that with me, ready? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. One of the great verses of the Bible. Verse two, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Follow with me. You're not condemned. Say that with me today. I'm not condemned. Say that. I'm not condemned. You are free. Say that with me today. I am free. You're condemned. You're free. That's what Jesus said. Verse 3. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son, Jesus Christ in parentheses, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Notice what he did. He condemned sin in the flesh. Notice this phrase. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Jump down to verse 9, if you would. You, however, Paul speaking to, to Roman believers, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Strong words. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life 
because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Would you pray with me today? Lord, what an awesome passage of scripture. So deep, so profound, so true. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand it. Lord, give our, give our mind understanding clarity of thought today. But not only that, Lord, help us to understand it and embrace it in our hearts. Help us to realize as we've sang that you love us more than we could ever imagine. And you not only love us more than we could ever imagine, but you have given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. You've given us everything we need to be victorious over sin. Everything we need, Lord, to live in a way that honors and glorifies you. Help us to understand that today through the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's message is really simple. Normally we're very expositional in our message. Today I want to be just a little topical and lay the foundation of what we're talking about. I want to see three things in the message today. The first is this. I want us to recognize the misconceptions of the gospel. Many people, myself included, and maybe some of us today have had some misconceptions about the gospel. I wanna, I wanna recognize those misconceptions. I want us to rediscover the magnificence of the gospel today. And I want us to rediscover the magnitude of the gospel as well. So are you ready this morning? Fasten your seatbelts on. Let's go. The first thing we must do is this. It's important that we recognize the misconceptions of the gospel. As I, as I mentioned a few moments ago, there are many today who have confused the gospel with religion. They've confused the gospel with rules. They've confused the gospel with prosperity. They've confused the gospel with a host of other things. Let me mention three common misconceptions, and there's many that we could mention. Let me mention three common misconceptions that many people have, even evangelical believers have, of the gospel. The first is this. The first misconception is this. Incorrectly responding to the gospel as an event rather than a journey. Incorrectly responding to the gospel as an event rather than a journey. Now, don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. There, there often is a moment in our lives when the truth of the gospel becomes a reality in our hearts. As I mentioned a few moments ago, that happened to me when I was five years old. Never forget, 1512 25th Street, Canton, Ohio. I remember kneeling in the living room with my mom and dad on either side of me. I remember today, it's so poignant in my mind, I can remember what the, what the texture of the couch was like. I mean, that was, a, that was a significant watershed moment for me. Many of you can point to a specific time in your life when you became a follower of Jesus Christ. But here's what I want you to catch today. The gospel is not only a one-time occurrence. The gospel is a journey. That's beautifully, beautifully illustrated in, in uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Anybody ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Kind of an older book. Christian, who's the protagonist, the, the lead character in the story of Pilgrim's Progress, is on a journey to the celestial city. He's traveling, and he's, he's traveling to heaven. And Pilgrim's Progress recounts his journey. Yes, there was a moment in his life when he decided, I am going to begin walking towards heaven. But the journey that he's on is filled with trials. It's filled with tribulations. It's filled with setbacks. And yes, many victories as well. Great story. John Bunyan, by the way, wrote it when he was in a prison for preaching the gospel. Great story to read. I read that, and I can relate with that. Can you? Because my life is not just, you know, I, I, I gave my life to Christ and it's just one solid upward road to heaven. I mean, there's trials in my life and tribulations in my life and moments when I blow it and moments when I have victories. 
Can you relate to that? The gospel is a journey. Here's what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.6. Paul said this, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So what is he talking about? Boy, well, there was a moment when God began that work in us. And God is in the process of molding us and shaping us into who he wants us to be. A few weeks ago, Mark brought a great message, and he, and he brought it out this way, and we're going to see it at the end, that, that if we're followers of Jesus Christ, we have been saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved. It's a journey. I say that because I run into many people and I have conversations with so many people today and I ask them, talk to me about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And often they'll say, well, 20 years ago, uh, I prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into my life. And I rejoice with that, but for the last 20 years, there's been no growth there. For the last 20 years, the gospel is not impacting them. Every time they talk about the gospel, it goes back to this one event. And today, it's not impacting their lives. It's not a journey for them. I trust the gospel for you is a journey. If you're here today and your Christian experience only consists of a moment in which you made a spiritual decision, but but that moment hasn't blossomed into a life in which God is molding you and shaping you into who he wants you to be. Let me share with you today that the gospel has so much more for you. Let me give you the second misconception. The second misconception is incorrectly thinking that the gospel is only about heaven, and it's not about our life here on earth. We're guilty of that because at times when we share the gospel, the one question that we ask people is this, do you know where you're going when you die? Do you know you're going to heaven? And don't get me wrong, the gospel is about heaven and that is our destination. Jesus said, John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you can be also. Yes, the gospel is about heaven heaven and we want you to know that you're going to heaven but it's not just about heaven it's not just me having my ticket stamped to heaven and now okay I'm ready to go all right now I can do whatever I want to do and God isn't concerned about my life from now until the moment when he calls me home no that's not what the gospel is about it's about much more than that. Here's a third misconception. It's incorrectly thinking that the gospel only results in justification and has nothing to do with our sanctification. I think you need to write the word only in your outline there. I think I forgot it, but incorrectly thinking that the gospel only results in justification and it has nothing to do with our sanctification. Now, justification to define the words is the removal of guilt. Justification is the declaration that we are righteous in the sight of God. And by the way, that is my favorite New Testament word. You and I were declared righteous in the sight of God when we gave our heart and life to Jesus just as if we never, ever sinned. And the reason you and I can gain entrance into heaven today is not because we're good people, it's not because we come to church on on Sunday morning, it's not because we do all of these things, it's because of Jesus Christ. God declared us righteous, as if we never, ever sinned. I'm so grateful that justification is a part of our salvation experience, but it doesn't end there. God desires to also sanctify us. The word sanctify means to make holy. And God desires through the power of the gospel to make us holy, to change our thoughts, to change our actions, to change our words. Salvation is not just justification. It's sanctification as well. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. 
the, the, the old things have passed away and all things have become, all things are becoming new. So, so, so here's a question for you as we begin this morning. How is the gospel to you? Is the gospel just a one-time event where you made the spiritual decision and, and since then you've kind of moved away from it and, and you go back to it every now and then? But the gospel has no relevance for your life today. That's what we want to talk about the next few weeks. We need to recognize the misconceptions, and there's so many more. Let, let me show you a second thing in your notes today. I want to rediscover the magnificence of the gospel. In, in this study, we want to recognize that the gospel truly is splendid. The gospel is glorious. It's brilliant. It's majestic. And yes, it is magnificent. I'm afraid, though, that many believers get bored with the gospel. You, you know the old saying, familiarity, what? Breeds contempt. And, and, and because we know the gospel so well, the, the gospel almost becomes a ho-hum experience to us. Oh, I hope the pastor talks about something a whole lot deeper than the gospel today. I hope he just doesn't talk about the gospel. If we're not careful, we view it as something, oh, I understand that. And, and we lose the magnificence of it. I tried my best to think, what's the best way that I can illustrate that? Something that, that in the past I was awed by, I was, I was captivated by, and if I'm not careful, I see that so often that it, it becomes normal to me, and I lose the wonder of it. And the best illustration that I could give was the beauty of my wife, Vicki. Watch how I do this, guys, all right? Watch and learn. This is a great way to compliment your wife, huh? But, but it's true. Remember, guys, when you first cast your eyes upon your wife? I mean, whether you're walking down the road and it's like, whoa, you know, look at that. And you were captivated by her beauty. And you probably told her on a regular basis, you're gorgeous, you're beautiful, you're wonder, wonderful. I'm so lucky to have you. And then, year after year, happens. You wake up beside this beautiful person each and every day, and you lose the wonder of her or his beauty. You're just as beautiful today, Vicki, as you were 32 years ago. If we're not careful, we do that with the gospel. Remember the first time you heard that he loves you? That there's a God in heaven who loves you not because of who you are, but there's a God in heaven who loves you in spite of who you are. That God loved you so much that God paid the price for all of your sins. And when you first came to Christ, there was, a, there was a, a, a magnificence about the gospel. You couldn't read about it enough. You couldn't sing about it enough. It was so fresh. It was so real. It was so vibrant in your life. But now you've been a believer for years. And you've heard hundreds of messages about the gospel. And it becomes something normal in your life. Oh, my desire is through this message, through these ser this message series in my life, that I recapture the magnificence of the gospel, and that you do as well. Can I show you a passage of scripture? Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. This is a great passage of scripture. I'm going to read it in just a second. John, John Calvin talks about this passage of Scripture and says it refers to the private longing of the prophets to understand and experience what they were prophesying, what you and I are living. 1 Peter chapter 1, notice verse 10. Peter says, concerning this salvation. Now, if you go back, 
I want you to catch the context because Peter's talking about everything that God has done for us. Verse 9, he says, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 10, he says, now concerning the salvation. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Here's what Peter is talking about, and I'll, I'll give you the next point in your notes so you can write it down. The Old Testament prophets longed to fully understand and experience the gospel. I've tried my best to understand these verses because sometimes we have the erroneous thought that, that the prophets wrote these things. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit and, and we understand that the point of inspiration is, is in the pen and they were writing these things and they didn't have a clue what they were writing about. God was just inspiring to them and here's Isaiah writing Isaiah chapter 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and all of that but they really didn't comprehend what they were talking about and Peter says no, no, no. There was a comprehension. There was a comprehension that Isaiah was, was predicting, and he understood that he was predicting that, that the Messiah would come, and that the Messiah would give his life as a ransom for everyone. And the idea that Peter is making is that there was a, a longing to understand that even more, and not only to understand it, but to be able to experience it. To them, it was future. To them, it was still a foretelling. But to you and I today, it's what? It's already happened. It's already taken place. It is a fact of history. We can look back and say, Jesus Christ came, lived, and died for us. Here's what Peter is saying. That the Old Testament prophets long to understand that like we understand it. And they long to experience it like we experience it. But I want to show you the last verse of verse 12. Notice what it says. Let me read verse 12 again. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Notice this phrase. Things into which the angels long to look. Wrap your mind around that. The, the NIV says it this way, even angels long to look into these things. The New Living Translation says it is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Here's what I wrote in my notes. The angels never get tired of looking into the depths of the gospel. You figure those angels, the seraphim and the cherubim that are around the throne of God 24-7 crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Those who were there who understand, they see Jesus, the resurrected Lord. They see him sitting on the throne. They never get tired. They never get bored of who he is and what he's done. And not only that, the idea conveys a longing on their parts to experience what you and I experience. You see, they are created beings for whom Jesus did not die. They are created beings who have not experienced the magnitude of the love of God like you and I have experienced. They are created beings who have not experienced the forgiveness of sin, the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, the empowerment of God to live a Christian life. And the angels sit back with a tinge of longing, seeking to fully experience and understand what you and I have the privilege of experiencing on a regular basis. Here's the way that I summarized all of that in my notes. It is one thing to understand 
the gospel. It is quite another to truly experience it. It is one thing to understand the gospel. It's another thing to truly experience it. Listen, don't allow your understanding and appreciation of the gospel to only be intellectual. Intellectual assent is different than faith. Let me say that again. Intellectual assent is different than faith. Intellectual belief is not enough. Remember that even the demons believe and they tremble, but there's no faith there. And so there's a difference between us understanding the facts of the gospel and us truly recognizing the magnificence of the gospel. Can I ask you just a couple of simple questions today? When was the last time in, the, in your heart of hearts you thanked, tr- truly thanked God for sending Jesus Christ? When was the last time that you paused and you thanked Jesus Christ for having lived the life that you cannot live? When was the last time that you thanked Jesus for taking your place on the cross, dying in your Stead, and then rising again, sealing our victory. When was the last time you were moved by that? When was the last time that you realized the magnificence of that and you sat in wonder and awe of all that God has done for you? As we study the gospel, we want to rediscover the magnificence of the gospel. Let me show you one final thing. We want to rediscover the magnitude of the gospel. What does the gospel entail? The first thing it entails is this. The gospel involves the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's the way Paul says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if we can put it up on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. By the way, you know what the word gospel means? Good news. It's good news. It's exciting news. I would remind you, brothers, of the good news I preach to you, which you received in which you stand, verse 2, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. What does the gospel entail? It entails the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's not something we should celebrate only on Easter Sunday, on Easter weekend. As a matter of fact, you know why we meet on Sunday mornings? You know why we're gathered together on Sunday morning and not on Saturday, according to the Old Testament Sabbath? Because we meet on Sunday morning to celebrate what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're here today because the tomb is empty. We're here today because Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. And Sunday is our Independence Day. It's our day of victory. That's the gospel. But let me show you a second thing. The gospel, though, not only involves the death and resurrection of Jesus, but it involves his life as well. The gospel involves the life of Jesus. Somehow we have forgotten that the vicarious, substitutionary death of Jesus was only possible because of his perfect life. Let me say that again. His death on the cross, taking your place and mine, his substitutionary death, his vicarious death, was only possible because of his perfect life. An imperfect sacrifice is unacceptable. Remember the Old Testament law? That the children of Israel, whenever they brought a lamb to be sacrificed, that lamb had to be what? It had to be spotless 
and without blemish. You wouldn't bring a maimed lamb. You wouldn't bring a, a dirty lamb. You would bring your very best, spotless, perfect lamb. That's what the law demanded. Jesus as the perfect, sinless Son of God offered himself as the sacrifice for your sins and mine. It was his sinless life that made his sacrificial death effective. It is his sinless life and his death that makes us acceptable to God. We see that in Romans chapter 8. If you go back to Romans chapter 8 in that very first phrase that we saw, Paul says this, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The word condemnation is a forensic term. It's a forensic term that includes both the sentence and the execution of the sentence. It's hard for us to, com uh, to comprehend it because most of us have never been sentenced for, for anything. Most of us have never stood before the judge, and thankfully most of us have not, and the judge looked at us and said, you know, pound the gavel, if that's the way they do it, and say, I pronounce you guilty of this. And then the judge not only sentences you, but executes the sentence. The word condemnation there has the idea of not only the pronouncement of the sentence, but the execution of the sentence as well, the carrying out of the sentence. So here's what Paul says, there is no condemnation. There is no sentence that is given to you. There is no execution of any sentence that is given to you if you are in Christ Jesus. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8 and verse 33. Notice this verse. Paul says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. The reason no one can condemn you is because Jesus already took your place. The price has already been paid. It's interesting, the, the word, the first word is, um, I think it's the first word in the NSV, let me see. There is therefore, now it's the fourth word, now, no condemnation. Now is a time word. It indicates that such freedom is not something that we will inherit in the future but it indicates that that is something that you and I possess right now. It's what we talked about just a few moments ago. We are free. We are not condemned. We are free because of Jesus' perfect life and because of Jesus' sacrificial death. We are now, at this very moment, free of condemnation. He completely appeased the wrath of of God towards our sin. God's wrath towards your sin and mine is completely satisfied because of Jesus Christ. There's a second thing, let me give it to you quick. Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament law. Perfectly filled it. Romans 8, 2 through 4. For the law of spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. If you jump down that phrase, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Think with me for just a second. You and I regularly violate the Old Testament law. Do we not? If we were honest... We regularly violate it, do we not? We lie, we covet. Um, we don't admit that we covet, but we do. We see somebody else like, oh, I sure wish I had that car, or I sure wish I had you know, that person's phone, or I sure wish I had this. We covet, we get angry, we love other things more than we love God. We regularly violate the Old Testament law. Thus, the law condemns us. There's no way you and I can perfectly fulfill it. Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says that, that the law doesn't save us. The law just shows us that we're guilty before God. All of us are. Here's the bottom line. We would be sunk, completely sunk, if it weren't for Jesus. He did what we can never do. He passed what we fail. He pleased God. 
when our actions do not please him. That's why Paul says, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. So, so, so here's what happens. Brian dies one day, hopefully not today or tomorrow. Brian dies and stands before God, and Brian shows up at heaven, and here I am. Obviously, that's not going to happen. You're not going to have to knock, but bear with me for just a second for illustration's sake. And I show up, and here I am. What's your name? Brian Burkholder. Let me check the registry here of uh, whether you deserve to be in here or not. And the whole time my knees are knocking. Oh my word, am I going to get in? Am I not going to get in? And they look at the registry. And they say, oh, you perfectly fulfilled the law. The wrath of God has been completely satisfied for you. Brian, God is pleased with you. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And I'm sitting back thinking, oh my word, did they miss all of the mistakes that I made? Did they miss all of the times that I violated the Old Testament law? No. Jesus fulfilled it, completely fulfilled it, and fulfills it in my place and in yours. The righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in you and in me because of Jesus Christ. What a blessed truth. Let me give you one last thing and we're done. God provides continuous victory for the believer. Verses 9, 10, and 11. It's what, it's what Mark talked about a few weeks ago. He talked about the Christian's past. You and I are saved. Verse 9, you, however, Paul says, speaking to believers, you, however, are not in the flesh, but you were in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Here's what happened the moment that you confessed your sin and you, by faith, turned to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God lives within you. And Paul says, you are no longer in the flesh, but you are now in the Spirit. Anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. The Christian's past, the moment when you began that journey, you gave your life to Jesus Christ. The second in verse 10 is the Christian's present. Not only have you been saved, but you are being saved. Verse 10, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of of righteousness. In just a few weeks, we're going to talk about the gift of righteousness. What does that mean, that the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been placed in your account and mine? Here's a question. Why is it that we are so often defeated by something that has already been defeated by Jesus Christ? Think about that. You, you and I are defeated by things on a regular basis that Jesus already won the victory over. We allow ourselves to be defeated by something that Jesus has already defeated. Jesus' death on the cross not only freed us from the penalty of sin, but it frees us from the power of sin. We do not have to give in to sin. You sit back and say, I hear people say all the time, Amber, I just can't control it. <laughs> I just got this urge and I just had to give in to it. No, you didn't. You did not. Jesus already won the victory over that urge. And as you surrender to him and you allow the truth of the gospel to live through you, you can overcome those temptations. And the last is this, the Christian's future. Not only have you been saved and are you being saved, but you will be saved. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Here's what I'm convinced of, and it was true of my life, and probably still is. We do not realize the power that the gospel gives to us. We do not realize the power that is available to us through the gospel. 
Here's a simple illustration, all right? Most of us have uh, phones that now are computers that can do pretty much anything. If you have an iPhone, if you have a Samsung, I mean, you, have, you, you have a computer that is more powerful than any computer that you would have had just a few years ago. And, and, and often we respond to the gospel like this, all right? Imagine having a phone that can do everything. It can give me directions. It has GPS. I can ask Siri, Siri, tell me where the closest uh, McDonald's is, and it tells me within a few seconds that there's there's McDonald's right around the corner. I mean, uh, you know, tell me this, and all of a sudden, we have this phone that has unbelievable capabilities. But imagine I had this phone that has unbelievable capabilities, and all I do is make phone calls with it. That's it. I don't do anything else. I, I don't use it to search the internet. I don't use any app for, uh, for directions. I don't do anything. I have this phone that has unbelievable potential, and I'm not even beginning to use the potential that it has. I'm limited to all I do is make phone calls with it. That might be you today, right? If that is, your phone can do other things, all right? It can do great things, your phone, all right? Uh, I'm afraid often that's the way it is in our spiritual life. God has given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. He's given us his word. He's given us the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. He has gifted us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He has placed within us his seed that enables us to be victorious over sin. And we take the power of the gospel and we minimize it to just a small fraction of what it can do in our lives. Rediscover the magnitude of the gospel. Rediscover that God desires for you and me not only to be declared righteousness, but for God to produce holiness, for God to produce Christ-likeness, for God to make us husbands that love and honor our wives, for God to make us dads and moms who train up our kids in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, that God makes us believers that control our tongues, that are able to curb our appetites and desires. I can't do that, and you can't but the gospel can.